Madam Chairperson, in relation to uh, item 4B, which is about adjudication, remedies, repatriation, redress and compensation, um, this is a major topic requiring much more examination and discussion, but let me present some of the issues that this organisation perceives exist under this topic. The declaration itself contains specific text in, in the articles on actions to be taken by states in particular to implement the rights of Indigenous peoples. It is generally understood, even by the states, that cogent text is needed to realise the rights of Indigenous peoples. In addition to identifying the rights, the declaration itself describes how that right might be exercised through state, state actions and Indigenous peoples' participation. A declaration which addresses the collective rights of Indigenous peoples deals with a complex area. For example, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples have coverage of self-determination, which covers collective identity, security, decision-making, representation and governance, social structures, institutions, systems and internal obligations, treaties and external obligations. It covers development, collective development, including cultural integrity, social well-being, political development and economic development. It covers land rights, which includes territorial integrity, sustainable social, economic, environmental and spiritual interrelationship, resources and development. It covers cultural identity, which involves belief system, spiritual connection and succession, socio-cultural institutions, language, indigenous knowledge, intellectual property, cultural development. And it covers non-discrimination, which includes truth, justice and remedy, compensation, freedom, equality, equal access and participation, tolerance, education and awareness. As I have already postulated, the Declaration relies upon the provisions in the Articles that are intended to assure that the rights of Indigenous peoples, and these are rights which are already enshrined in international human rights treaties and international law, and therefore can already be described as part of the state's inherent obligations as members of the United Nations, that these rights are acknowledged and implemented. It has been said many times in the past, there are, these are rights which other populations already enjoy and take for granted but which have, by design, been denied to Indigenous peoples. So there are specific mechanisms built in this declaration for the clear purpose of establishing an acceptable regime for addressing deep-rooted problems, which have to be addressed as part of promoting, protecting and facilitating rights of Indigenous peoples. I have placed these mechanisms in the declaration into three categories. The first category is a system of engagement, and that deals um, in Article and, uh, 8 and Article 30, the system of engagement is about how will states relate to Indigenous peoples, how do they deal with Indigenous peoples uh, in relation to partnership, etc. The second category is about the impartial procedure for justice, remedy and accord. And these are covered by Articles 8, 11, 12, 37 and 40. So this procedure is looking at historical injustices, the reasons why we say uh, face such difficult disadvantages uh, in these contemporary times. They are necessary procedures because without address of these disadvantages, without remedy for things that have been taken away from us, and without some sort of accord, some way of dealing with this through appropriate mechanisms, um, the, our rights can never be fully acknowledged. And the third area of category to which I refer is intercession without bias or malice. This is about um, how um, decisions or disputes between the state parties and Indigenous peoples can be dealt with in an objective way. Um, not where the state says, well, we're the state, we decide, and therefore we decide in our favour. Uh, there are many articles that deal with the, um, how to have fair intercession. These are Articles 8, 13, 27, 30, 32, 37 and 40. Madam Chair, for, for reason of the brevity of the intervention, I won't go into the details of those particular articles that I've mentioned as to how they apply, but I hope that people will give consideration to those three categories that I have mentioned. Now, um, finally, I would like to give a brief account of the situation that we face as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our home territories. On the system of engagement, for example, we have no treaties and no constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. Until 1972, the national government in Australia did not exercise any legislative responsibility at the national level for our peoples. During the next 24 years until 1996, 
the national government recognised increasing levels of self-management and self-determination for Indigenous peoples, culminating in the formation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, or ATSIC, um, and that body being approximately 400 representatives elected by popular elections from our communities and became the main body to engage with governments at all levels on policies and programs for a people. However, ATSIC was abolished in 2005, resulting in a complete loss of representation or voice in national, regional or local affairs to this very day. No structure has yet replaced ATSIC and the governments of Australia have no rules for engagement with us, nor legislative standards for the recognition or protection of our rights. On the category of impartial procedure for justice remedy and accord, the land rights movement in Australia, a strong campaign by our peoples for reform, has been quashed by the national native title laws. Following court recognition in 1991 of the existence of inherent ownership rights of Australia by the First People, the government has legislated to end those inherent rights by legislation and has established instead a biased procedure preventing wise success in the native title procedures. The administration of native title is appalling and the laws and procedures are bewildering to traditional owners. The infrastructure for native title, including advocacy for rights of traditional owners, has been controlled and manipulated by the government policy to prevent rights to land. The Committee on Elimination of Race Discrimination has certified since 1999 that the native title laws in Australia are in breach of the Race Convention. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have no access to independent arbitration of our land rights. From 1998, Following a change in the national administration, the national government has used its legislative powers to discriminate against Indigenous peoples in Australia and encourage the state governments of Australia to direct their attention to assimilation policies and laws. The Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination is, as we speak, currently considering actions by the government which will involve compulsory acquisition of Aboriginal lands amongst other discriminatory actions. The Racial Discrimination Act has been suspended in Australia since 1998 relating to our land rights and has been suspended since 2007 in relation to community control in remote areas of Australia. This means there are no legal remedies to Indigenous peoples in important areas of our rights. There are no acceptable processes of engagement in Australia. Australia refuses to pay compensation for any past injustices, including injustices such as atomic bomb testing on Aboriginal lands and on Aboriginal people. The stolen, weight, the stolen generation, stolen wages, extinguishment of Aboriginal title over the colonial history, or mining royalties. In legal terms, the government maintains it has no fiduciary responsibility to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. All decisions are made by government and subject to political considerations which weigh against the interests of us as First Peoples. There is no regional intergovernmental organisation with human rights standards, that is, uh, at the international level in our region, the Pacific area or the Asia Pacific area, which has human rights standards or human rights courts. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have no avenue and never had an avenue to appeal the ongoing colonisation of us as peoples, the theft of our lands or the continuing exploitation, extensive exploitation of the natural resources in Australia. As you can see, Madam Chairperson, in this very brief and broad presentation, without attention to the establishment of mechanisms under the Declaration to pursue and protect Indigenous rights, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will continue to be oppressed by a racist and unsympathetic state. Thank you, Madam Chairperson.